Okay, so the reason why we have a whole chapter on like the cell membrane is because it's very important to the function of the cell. Why do you think it'd be so important? To have a functioning cell membrane. Regulates what goes in and goes out. Yeah, exactly. So you're, there's lots of stuff going on, on on the inside and it needs to uh, be regulated as far as you're gonna make waste products and those have to get out. Okay, and you need energy and that has to get in somehow. So the cell membrane is very important for that. Um, I don't have a meter stick. Excuse my finger. Okay, so um, for a long time, the chemical composition of this, the cell membrane was a mystery. Um, but uh, we found that phospholipid bilayers will naturally occur if you have a phospholipid. Um, and so that was the, the basic structural component of our cell membrane. Um, and we've come up with this model. It's called the flu fluid, mosaic, fluid mosaic model. Fluid because it's not, it's not like a sidewalk. It's not concrete. It's moving. There are parts within it, and they don't stay constant. And mosaic means it has a lot of different parts to it. It's not all made of one thing. It has a lot of different things within there. Um, the main component is the phospholipid bilayer. We mentioned phospholipids before when we talked about lipids. Um, it has a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic end. The hydrophilic end is the phosphate part, so that's represented here in the yellow part. And then on your phospholipid, you have lipids, which are like the tails, and those are hydrophobic, and those are attracted towards each other, and that's why it makes this bilayer. Within there, though, you have embedded functional parts called made of protein, proteins. Um, and we'll go over the different functions and the different types of proteins that are found embedded within there. Um, and then you also have some structural components such as cholesterol. And we'll talk about what cholesterol is made of as well. But uh, that, those are the main things found within our lipid bilayer. That's the fluid mosaic model. And these form spontaneously in water. Uh, and why was that? We discussed a couple times. If you put a phos if you put this phospholipids randomly into a thing of water, they will congregate like this. That is because they're Hydrophobic tails are attracted towards each other, and the hydrophilic um, heads are attracted towards the water. Um, when we look at a single phospholipid, they can be organized into three different uh, sections. And that's what this is up here. You have the hydrophobic the phosphate head, the lipid tail, and then the uh, uh, um, glycerol molecule which ties them together. Okay, but when you're looking at a whole membrane, you can differentiate between different parts within the phospholipid bilayer. One of them is lipid rafts, so that has cholesterol and a specific type of phospholipid called a sphingolipid. And the phospholipids are formed in the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, remember when you made your models and when we went over the different organelles, the endoplasmic reticulum had a bunch of like bubbles coming off of it. It can form little phospholipid bilayers and then those can be added into the cell membrane. Okay, I just talked about this, but this is the different structure of the phospholipid. You have the phosphate group, which is the head, and you have the fatty acids, which are the tails. And then you have a glycerol, which connects the two. Okay, glycerol is a three-carbon polyalcohol, and it will bond to both. Without them, you aren't going to be able to have, without the glycerol, you're not going to be able to bond, bind to that hydrophobic and hydrophilic molecule together. Okay, and then a sphingolipid, which I mentioned before, has a very similar structure. It looks almost exactly the same. Just has some slight differences in the type of molecules used.
Okay? And again, I rushed here straight from the airport, so I didn't get a chance to put on my fancy clothes. So I'm wearing a zombie shirt. All right. You ready now? Okay. All right, so when we, when we talk about the proteins embedded within the, the lipid bilayer, there are two main categories. The first are integral plasma membrane proteins, or you could say IPIM. Um, and they are integral, meaning integrated within the plasma membrane. You can see three examples of that here. You've got um, this uh, helical structure here, which is embedded within the lipid bilayer. Okay? And it's going to have made of amino acids that are hydrophilic, uh, sorry, hydrophobic, just like the lipids. And then these parts extending outside and inside, what are, what are they going to be like? It's hydrophilic. Yeah, they're going to be hydrophilic because they're going to be exposed to the water as a cytoplasm on, on each side. Okay, and you can have different structures. You can have one of these kind of by itself and then within there, or you can have a beta plated sheet, which is going to make more of a, what is that, kind of like a basket uh, embedded within there. But all of them have, they are, they completely span the lipid bilayer, so they're <laughs> integral. Okay, oops. Okay, uh, and they can be carriers, so they can carry stuff in or out of the cell, uh, or they can just be channels, so just open areas, so an aquaporin would be an example of one that allows water in and out, or they can be receptors, which will bind to a molecule like a hormone which will cause a change within the cell. Okay, the other type would be the PPIMPs, so the peripheral plasma membrane proteins, so peripheral meaning on the outside or on the inside. They aren't, they do have a component to them which is embedded within the, the lipid bilayer, but it doesn't span the whole lipid bilayer. It's on one end, it's either on the outside or on the inside. Okay, some of these are glycoproteins and glycolipids. Uh, that prefix glyco refers to the sugar part of it. Okay, and this one is a glycolipid, so it has a lipid part to it. And this one's glycoprotein, so it has a protein part to it. That's going to be what's embedded within the lipid bilayer, and then the sugars are going to be extending out from that. Okay, so here's an extracellular matrix protein with some glyco. Uh, uh, sugars attached to it, a glycoprotein here. Those are embedded within but are outside the cell. Okay, and then there's some other on the inside as well. Those are going to be your PPIMPs. Okay, so those are important for recognizing what type of cell it is. So uh, they'll have immune function if, they're, if it's an invading cell or a bacteria that's not supposed to be there. Um, the cell will recognize, or the body will recognize it by the glycoproteins and then go in and destroy it. They can also be carriers, so it can shuttle things across the plasma membrane, in or out. They'd be part of the interior protein network, so that's these over here, which attach to the cytoskeleton. And those are going to either help maintain the shape, <coughs> anchor proteins, so hold it, proteins in place or hold the cell in place, and they can help with binding to specific molecules such as your hormones. Did you need anything in my hand? Uh, no, we're good. We'll just be okay. answering. Okay. Thanks. All right, and so those are your PPIPs. All right, cholesterol, did anyone have everything in that one? Okay. Cholesterol is a very important molecule, um, especially when talking about uh, the plasma membrane. Usually you hear cholesterol, and uh, when do you usually hear cholesterol? Cheerios. Cheerios, <laughs> right? You lower your cholesterol, right? So cholesterol is usually referred to as a bad thing because when it builds up in your blood, it 
creates plaque and gives you heart disease. It'd be bad for you, but it's also a very important part of your body. You can't live without cholesterol. Okay, it has a, a important part which is hydrophilic and, a, and hydrophobic, so that it can fit within your lipid bilayer. So saturated fat, fatty acids. Um, what's an example of a saturated fatty acid? Please remember. They're saturated and unsaturated. Saturated is a bad kind. What's that? Butter. Butter, yeah. So animal fats. <laughs> you must be butter because you're on a roll. Sat animal fats are saturated. <laughs> and then uh, plant lipids are usually unsaturated. Okay? The lipid bilayer, if, if these fatty acids are saturated fats, then it's, they're going to pack close together. Okay, and it's going to make it less permeable. So what cholesterol does is it breaks up those fatty acids so they aren't packed together as tightly and so it allows a little more permeability. So it allows things to go in and out. Okay, so this then goes back to one of our fundamentals of biology, that structure relates to function. <clears throat> you can have a different array of functions based on the different array of, of uh, structures within the proteins. If they have common structural features, they can relate to their role as membrane proteins. And these structural components allow proteins to be embedded within the lipid bilayer. So nonpolar portions, where are you going to find those? Let's say in your Integral plasma membrane protein, where are you going to find the nonpolar portions? Okay, so we're going to have to review a little bit. Is water a polar or a nonpolar? It's polar. It's polar, okay? And um, what will polar molecules bind with? Other polar or nonpolar? Other polar. Other polar, okay? That's what it means to be hydrophilic. It means you're polar. So, um, if a protein, a, a, a integral plasma membrane protein has a nonpolar portion, where are you going to find that within the lipid bilayer? The outside is going to be polar. The inside, right. The outside and the inside, sorry, within it. So we say this is outside, this is inside. And then this is within. Where are you going to find the nonpolar portions? Within, right? Okay. Uh, chemical bonding uh, is going to be important based on the different um, amino acids used in the proteins. You're going to have transmembrane domains. So remember, we talked about that beta plated sheet. That's a domain a specific type of protein that's going to fit across the, the protein. You have pores such as the aquaporin, which allows water in and out, basically going to create holes in the lipid membrane. Okay, and we see these throughout all living things, okay. Um, bacteria are going to have different combinations of these all the way up to your human cells are going to have different combinations of these, but we can look at the function or the structure of the protein and then um, have a good idea of what its function is. This is the point we're trying to make here. Um, this over here is a slide of a heart cell. Heart is made of what type of tissue? Muscle, yes. Okay. Um, and you can tell it's a heart muscle because it has these little striations here. These are called intercalated discs. And that is a protein um, that connects two cells together. And you can tell by, I mean, not just by looking at it, but we know the, the, the protein that makes those. And it's the same protein that makes gap junctions. 
And what were gap junctions used for? You asked me about it. What's that? Yeah, so cell signaling. Okay. So those are used for signaling among heart cells, uh, which is important because a heart has to contract, all those muscles have to contract at the same time. And the way they do that is by signaling between the cells. All right, permeability is very important. Um, the, for the cell to function, it has to be at a certain permeability. And the lipid bilayer is semi-permeable, meaning it doesn't let everything in. It blocks some things, but it will let some things through um, easily. Um, and they can allow things in and out in one of two ways. It can be passive transport or it can be active transport. Um, and we're going to go over these different, different types of passive and active transport. Passive transport means it does not require energy. You might want to write that in there. And the energy molecule used in cells is called ATP. So passive does not need ATP. It just flows naturally. Active then It requires ATP. Okay? Without it, it's not going to function. It requires energy. So you can use those terms, energy and ATP, kind of interchangeably. If it requires energy, this is how cells use energy through ATP. So passive transport, again, does not require energy. The simplest uh, way this happens is molecules will flow from greater to lesser concentration. We already did some of this in lab. Um, you had diffusion through a, a gel. And what were the other two experiments we did? The, the, the elodia leaf? Yeah. So you had diffusion. Uh, and then you also dropped the little purple stuff in the dish. Watch that. And then we did the perfume. So you had it through a gel, through a liquid, and through, a, through the air. Okay. But that was another experiment we did. <laughs> well, all that was going on was you had a greater concentration of, of some substance, and it was flowing to the lesser concentrations. Okay? That is diffusion. Okay, the other ones, though, you have osmosis, which is basically diffusion only with water through a semi-permeable membrane. You have facilitated diffusion, um, where you have a little help by some sort of protein. And then you have filtration, which happens through, uh, through pressure. So this happens in your blood vessels. The pressure is caused by the beating of your heart, and that causes uh, molecules to flow in a certain direction. Okay, um, you have examples of this all over. Uh, when you're making Kool-Aid, how do you make Kool-Aid? Put sugar in the Kool-Aid. What happens when you first dump everything in there? It's all to the bottom. There's a bunch of sugar. You stir it up. In the end, what happens to the sugar? It's all mixed. Yeah. So it diffuses throughout the whole thing, and now it's equally concentrated throughout the whole thing. Um, yeah, perfume is another example. When you spray it, you don't, you don't smell it. If you're far away, you don't smell it right away, but you wait a few minutes, and it will flow all the way. Okay, so in a solution, which is, can be in liquid or in air, molecules flow from greater to lower concentration until they're evenly spaced. That's what diffusion is. A solution is made of a solvent, which is usually water or air, and then a solute, which is the molecule. So in this uh, example over here, we put a drop of red dye in water. What is the solvent? Water. What's the solute? The red dye. Okay. All 
Um, osmosis is a little bit different because you have a membrane that separates two solutions. Okay, and the solution is semi-permeable, or the membrane is semi-permeable, meaning it will let some things through, but it won't let other things through. Okay. Um, and the solutes is what can't get through, and the water can. So the same principle applies, though. The molecules are kind of trying to even out so that the concentration is even. But because these solutes can't fit through, so normally you have these, the greater concentration over here than you have over here. If this membrane wasn't here, which way would the molecules flow? Would these molecules flow in here or would these molecules flow there? Right. So it would go to there until it was all even down. But since these guys can't fit through there, instead of the solutes going over, the water is going to go this way until you have more water over here than you have over here until it's an equal concentration. That's osmosis. Is it, is it, is it like when you add the water to the other side, it dilutes? Like it, like why, why if you add more water to that side? Well, I'm not adding more water. Well, like taking it from the other side. I put it in the other? I wish I had a marker that worked. Okay, so let's go like this. We'll just make it really simple. This side has five. Here's the water level. This side has five solutes. This side has one. Normally, if we don't have this, like we said, these are just going to go over here until you have an equal concentration. So then both sides would have three. <coughs> be even. Okay, but because we have this membrane here, the solutes are going to try, but they can't fit through, so they're going to stay over here. This water is going to go in here and fill this up. So this is going to fall. And so now the concentrations are the same. These guys are going to space out. It's kind of like a proportion. Yeah, exactly. The ratio of water to solute is, is one to one here. Okay, the ratio of water to solute here is five to five which is the same thing as one-to-one. -one. Does that all make sense? Okay. So, we have some terms to describe our different concentrations. And we, we did a little bit of this in lab. These can be very confusing. But, the way to keep it straight is looking at the prefixes and the su suffixes, okay? So tonic refers to the solute. If something's hyper, it means it's elevated. There's lots of new. If you're hyper, what do you have a lot of? Energy, okay? So here we're just saying hypertonic, you have a lot of the solute. So you have a lot of the little things in there. Hypo means below. Okay. Hippos go below the water. Okay. Hypotonic means it has less of the solute. And iso means the same or equal. Okay, so which of these is hypertonic? The left or the right? Right. Hypertonic. So this one would be? Hypotonic, okay? And then isotonic, good. Yeah. So that's simple, but it, for some reason when you, yeah, when you start 
when you ask, get a question, people get them all mixed up. Okay, so just go back to this slide. Like, okay, hyper means above. Tonic is referring to the solute. If it has more solute, it's hypertonic. All right. Um, so osmotic pressure is important. This is the force needed to stop osmotic flow. And osmotic flow is that water flowing from lower to higher concentration. So a cell in a hypertonic solution Okay, so let's draw this. This is a cell. It has some of these in here. It has a, some solutes. If it's in a hypertonic solution, will the solution have more or less solutes? More. More. Good. Okay, so it's got a bunch of these. Okay, what do we know about this lipid membrane? What are some properties? Okay, it controls what's going in and out. What about its permeability? It's semi-permeable. Okay, so it's a semi-permeable membrane. It also has some polar parts and some non-polar parts. Okay, since it's semi-permeable, um, what if it was completely permeable? Or the opposite. Or everything. everything we got to do, okay? <laughs> if it's impermeable, then nothing. If it was completely permeable, what would happen to these solutes out here? They would go in until it evens out, right? Okay? But it's not. It's semi-permeable. So what's going to happen to these solutes? Nothing. Good. Instead, what's going to happen to the water? Which way is the water going to flow? Out. Okay, there's more. This is hypertonic, right? So what's this in here? Hypo. Okay, so if we set it up to be two membranes, like, so this next thing is... Which one's hyper? Hyper. Which one's hypo? Which way is the water going to flow? To the right. To the hyper. <laughs> I was reading. So the water is going to flow out into there. So why is it going to go if it's not trying to balance? It is. Because what will happen is this will shrivel because it's losing balance, water. If it's trying to balance, why wouldn't the hopper go to the hopper? The water is going out, so not the solutes. Just the water, and that's going to fill this up more with water, and then this water is going to go down. So now this is a 1 to 1 ratio, and this is a 5 to 5 ratio. It's the same thing's going on. Yes? It says hypotonic solution of gains water, causing the cells to fill. A cell in a hypotonic, oops, hypo, so I had it backwards. A cell in a hypotonic solution, so if we did this the other way. Okay, so that was, you got that one right though. But what that one's asking, All right, which one's hyper, which one's hypo? Right, so this is hyper, this is hypo. Which way is the water going to flow? Into the cell. Into the cell. That's, so what's it, that's going to cause the, the cell to swell with water until it bursts. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Um, 
what we did first, that's what's going on here, it caused it to shrivel. And then if it's in an isotonic solution, it's going to be just fine. Okay, so the way the water flows, that's the osmotic pressure. If they're isotonic, then there's no osmotic pressure because it's the same. Um, let's see. If you have a really strong membrane, though, it'll allow for more pressure. Um, a cell wall also adds some strength so it can even um, resist more osmotic pressure. So that's what we have in the prokaryotes, fungi, plants, and some protists have a cell wall. But if it's not strong, it may burst or shrivel up, um, which is why your blood or, or um, cytoplasm in general is, <clears throat> is regulated, the amount of solutes in there. Um, animal cells must be in, well, not in. Oh, um, isotonic solutions, right? Environments. Isotonic environments. Yeah. All right, facilitated <coughs> diffusion. All this is is one of those proteins embedded within the lipid bilayer allows, is used for substances to go through so that it can go from higher to lower concentration. But without that protein, they're not going to be able to get through. So it's facilitated by that protein. So some small molecules um, that are polar can't go through the lipid bilayer because of that lipid layer. It's going to be repelled by it. So they require that a channel protein in order to go through the lipid portion, but it doesn't require ATP. They just have to find the little channel. It's like a bridge. Go over the river. Um, and sometimes these are regulated by some sort of gate or channel um, so that they can be open or closed. Again, aquaporins are an example of this because water is a polar molecule. It's going to be repelled by that lipid portion. So they have to go through those channels. Okay, channel proteins also allow these some these smaller ions to pass through, which are charged particles, which are hydrophilic. So they are also going to have a hard time going through the lipid lipid part. Channels can be gated, so they are open or closed. Um, a good example of this are sodium-potassium channels, which allow potassium or sodium through. It's very important for signaling. And the flow of ions through these channels is determined by the concentration of ions on either side, the charge of the ions, and whether these proteins have their gate open or closed. Okay, carrier proteins, they transport ions or other molecules through the lipid mem membrane, such as glucose. Okay, so this is important across your digestive tract. After you break things down, they then are absorbed through your intestines. Um, glucose is one of those molecules that is shuttled through the membrane. Um, but they can only go so far. Um, there is a saturation point at which you, you, you might have too much glucose that's been absorbed, so you can't absorb any more. Um, and then there's also, you know, the proteins can only go so fast. You only go one at a time. So if all of them are being used at the same time, then you would say those are saturated. It's, it's reached its full potential.
Got that? All right, filtration. This is when a solution is forced through openings or pores. Um, so an example of this is like the hose with the holes in it that you use to water your lawn. Uh, you turn the water on and there's pressure created there. How much water comes out depends on that, that pressure. That would be filtration. Um, this also happens in your body through your kidney cells. You have these little capillaries filled with blood. <clears throat> Depending on how hard your heart is pumping, it will force water and small molecules out of the blood and it will then be trapped in, in the kidneys. All right, active transport, that's all for passive transport. Active transport, again, requires ATP. ATP is the energy molecule. And it is moving substances in the opposite direction. So it's moving it from low to high concentrations. And this is also going to require proteins that use ATP to then move it. Okay. The way ATP works is you have some potential energy found between three phosphate molecules. When you break one of those off into ADP, it means it's, uh, ATP means triphosphate, ADP is diphosphate, so then you have two instead of three. When you break one of those off, that potential energy is released, and then that energy can be used. Uh, to change the shape of the molecule, or to allow molecules through the, the proteins. Okay, so we have carrier proteins, and they can carry things through the lipid membrane. You can have a uniporter, which means it just does one at a time. Or you can have a symporter, which moves two molecules in the same direction. So sim is referring to the same. Or you can have antiporters, which move two molecules in the opposite direction. So they kind of do an exchange. And these can also be these terms can also be used to describe facilitated diffusion carriers as well. So if it uses ATP, you can have a uniporter that's um, actively transporting. Or if it's facilitating diffusion, then it would be uh, passively transporting. Sorry. All right. Um, bulk transport then is using the lipid bilayer itself and breaking off chunks of it and then uh, transporting that whatever's uh, trapped in there as a vesicle inside or outside of the cell. Endocytosis, endo referring to within. So that's where things are transported from outside into the cell. Okay, phagocytosis is when it takes in a molecule or particulate matter. Penocytosis is when you're only taking in fluid. Okay, so all of these, uh, let's see, this would be phagocytosis, you're engulfing a bacterial cell, and that they'll use uh, neutrophils, which are a, a T, uh, a white blood cell, will do that to destroy bacteria. Uh, you have a solute, which is dissolved in a fluid, being trapped within a membrane and taken within the cell, that's phenocytosis. And uh, you don't have to worry about that third one. Okay, exocytosis then is the opposite. So that's taking a vesicle, and this is done with waste products, and then you take it to the lipid membrane, and then the membranes fuse, and whatever's in there is pushed out of the cell. The forming of that membrane, or the combining of that membrane, and engulfing the substances, or expelling it out, requires ATP, so this is active transport. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, and again, here is some exocytosis. You have all these um, either um, you know byproducts of metabolism that you're trying to get rid of, or maybe you have made a a hormone. A, a cell is making a hormone and is releasing it into the blood. Um, they're in this vesicle that that combines with the lipid membrane, and as it does so, everything inside there is expelled. Okay, that's it for active and passive transport. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about cell signaling. Uh, not too much, but a, a few terms that you're going to need to know. First is a ligand. That is the molecule that acts as a signal. So we commonly refer to this as like a hormone floats around in your blood and it's picked up by cells to signal your cells to do something. In order for a cell to recognize the ligand, it has to have a receptor, okay, and it'll be at a certain structure that will bind to that ligand. It can bind with outside the cell, that would be extracellular, or it can bind within the cell, which would be intracellular. So some of them can pass through the lipid membrane and then attach somewhere else inside the cell or some of them need to do it on the outside. Okay, there are a few different types of signals. So if it's an autocrine signal, it will go to and from the same cell. So that's just going inside that cell to another part of the cell. Or you can have a paracrine signal that's sent from the same tissue. So different cells, but within the same tissue. So from one liver cell to another. Or you can have endocrine. Um, and that signal sent through a fluid, usually blood, from one tissue to another. And that's, technically, that kind of signal would be a hormone. These other ones are not hormones. They're per paracrine and autocrine uh, signaling molecules. But a hormone has to go through a fluid from one tissue to another. And so our endocrine system is made up of a bunch of tissues that make signaling molecules, release them in the blood, and then they affect other tissues throughout the body. Okay, synaptic signaling is uh, a signal sent from nervous tissue to a different type of tissue. So that happens whenever you move your muscles, your nerves are sending impulses to muscle cells. All right, and the last thing is G-coupled receptor. You have no idea about this. Um, I forgot to take it off, but don't worry about the slide unless you want to learn it for fun. And that's it. Any questions?